So a huge thank you and welcome from, from us at the EHF crew. Just a tiny little bit of context on this session. So this is part of the EHF mini springboard, which is a, a series of sessions that we're running this week um, in line with the organizational, the new organizational strategy of EHF. So EHF exists to partner with Aotearoa to find and build solutions to our toughest challenges so that Aotearoa New Zealand can be an inspiration of global leadership um, for future generations. And so that's kind of a big lofty statement that holds us together as an organization. Um, and it sort of makes itself real in three big, three ways. One is around activating our fellowship and our fellows. The other is around partnering meaningfully with Aotearoa New Zealand. And the third is around initiatives that show uh, promise for global leadership and uh, signals of global impact. And so this session in some ways covers across all three. Um, it's going to be led by one of our fellows, Shay Wright. Um, he, he'll share some further context and framing. Um, but before I hand over to Shay, I just want to do a couple of little bits of quick housekeeping. So we will be recording this session and live streaming the, the main presentation at the start of it. Um, uh, and then when we go into breakout rooms, we'll, we won't be recording or live streaming that part. Uh, we ask that just to minimize disruption, um, to stay on mute when you're not speaking and Shay's going to moderate some questions for us um, and we'll use the raise hand function of Zoom uh, and the chat function for that. So uh, that, that'll be the way to, to get involved there and then Shay will moderate. And just to, just to note that we've also got one of our fellows, Bex, in the room with us who's writing up a report um, to, to summarize the key learnings and um, things that come up. So keep an eye out for that as well. So we'll share some of the recordings, some of the the written reports and um, hopefully some invitations to continue the, the conversations. Um, so with that, I mentioned Shay's gonna lead the session. He's a fellow from cohort six uh, and it's hard to sometimes describe Shay's work because he's active in so many amazing things. Um, he's long been a champion for multi economic development, entrepreneurship and sort of backing bold ideas for systems change. Um, he's the co-founder of Te Whare Huka Huka uh, which supports the development of governance skills in young Māori. Uh, he's a speaker, convener, systems change entrepreneur, a member of the New Zealand Government Māori Economic Development Advisory Board. And we connected around the session in a recent um, Tatiriti training where Shay just sort of articulated this thing so beautifully, this super compelling challenge in a really clear, articulate um, economic focused way and we just saw the spark there for a thread that we should take further so thank you so much for joining us to explore this it's um i'm really looking forward to it um kia ora Shea, over to you my friend oh kia ora ants tēnā tātou e ngā hoa i roto e nei tu ahuatanga e pāna ki a tātou i tēnei wā uh, so i'll just open our hui with a uh, karakia or an incantation that calls upon our atua our deities to bestow on us the spirit of learning uh, and that allows us to kind of deep dive uh, into this particular challenge we're talking about today and be bold like the Tanifa so that we can be enlightened around what we can do to address it. E rangi e papa e te kahui tua uri uri whai oi o, whakarongo mai ki te tauira whakarongo. He koranga no ku kia tauwhera te a mai mātou, e nei ringa ringa, e nei waiwai o EHF ki te tāwharau take take, Tā maua ki te hau nui ki te hau ora i takea mai i te kāhui o ngā atua. Ruku tia mātou kia ū, ruku tia mātou kia nifa ki ngā iho take take o mātou o Aotearoa kia puta ki te whai ao ki te ao mārama, tuturu haka maua ki a tīna, haumi e hui e tāki. Tā e ngā mana e ngā reo e ngā rauranga tira mā, tēnā koutou. Koutou o ngā hau e whā, nau mai hara mai ki tēnei kōrero mō te take nui kei mui e tātou. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa. I see quite a few familiar faces, uh, some brown faces, some of our Māori champions from our communities around the place, um, and many fellows, uh, a number of you from um, calling in from outside of Aotearoa, New Zealand, and also some of you from here in New Zealand. So what a great uh, and auspicious group to have on the call today. Um, now, we're kind of tackling some big things over the next few days when I look at the nature of this particular impact springboard. But I guess that's really in the nature of EHF 
fellows and as community leaders. So um, we are amongst good company, but we're also um, not not averse, we're not, not averse to shying away from the, these big issues. And when we observe our taia or our environment, we, we see that these waves of change come in sets. And that really is the case for this current form of disruption, digital disruption, globalization, automation. We are in an interesting era where our economic models, our financial systems, our healthcare systems, our natural systems, uh, and even our demographics are changing significantly, rapidly. Uh, and it, it strikes me that we don't seem to be front-footing a lot of these trends. That may be something that's particularly the case in New Zealand. It may be something that some of you, you as fellows are seeing in other parts of the world as well. Now, if you're used to surfing the waves of change, then the prospect of it isn't such a bad thing. In fact, it can be quite exciting. But overwhelmingly, those waves crash on the heads of some. And in New Zealand, that tends to be uh, battering and drowning uh, those who don't have the luxury of, part of, of education, of connections, of support to brace uh, for these waves of change. And Māori tend to be at the forefront of that. So um, if, when we think about that context, it's something that we need to be changing for Māori so that we can ensure that there is greater levels of equity and opportunity, but actually it's a change we need to make for the benefit of Aotearoa New Zealand. We need an Aotearoa that works for all of us. And, and if we think about where that work's really needed, it's to create a future that works for Māori and Pacifica peoples in particular, given the proportions of who is going to make up our future workforce in New Zealand. And so we're going to look at this session through the lens of the economic challenge, not the social challenge or cultural challenge, which is an interesting different take to how we usually uh, talk about this, the, the challenges ahead of us. So as parts of New Zealand came out of lockdown, um, I was able to come home to the rural far north last week where 50% of our local population is Māori and where more than twice uh, as many Māori are unemployed compared to non-Māori. And yet the statistics, uh, even at an economic level, look just as dire in our urban areas uh, where the majority of Māori actually live. Um, even a job doesn't equate to success. Half of all Māori employed are in low-paid work, um, which is a proxy for insecure and vulnerable work. And in-work poverty is potentially going to get worse when we steer down the level of disruption we're talking about when we look at some of the uh, economic challenges that may face us uh, given COVID. And so, you know, this is this is pretty compelling challenge in itself, but our demographics are going to shift to make this challenge even greater. Māori Pacifica and other ethnic minorities are going, uh, are going to make up more than 50% of our workforce in the next 25 years. So if we don't catalyse change, then wealth inequality and our ability to actually pay for public services and healthcare and all of the benefits that we currently enjoy could reach a tipping point. Our economy and all of our public spending is going to rely on the incomes of young brown people. And if we aren't earning well, then that's going to be felt by everybody. Now, one of the interesting complexities about this challenge is that the value of the Māori economy has increased significantly over the past 20 years to around sort of $60 billion uh, on paper. But the living standards for Māori families continues to decline. So we're not seeing any causality on a macro level in, in these two things. So what this suggests is that we need to be paying far more attention to Māori households as the primary economic unit and looking at how we can increase incomes at that level rather than just looking at the top line Māori economy uh, figures. Now, it's an assumption uh, or a commonly held um, misconception, I guess, that 
iwi are the backbone of the Māori economy. They're actually not really uh, when we look at, the, at how that Māori economy is broken down. For example, in Auckland, 88% of the Māori economy, which is also the place where many Māori live, about a quarter of all Māori, 88% of the Māori economy in Auckland is in privately owned Māori businesses. So they are actually the backbone of that Māori economy. And research shows that Māori owned businesses are three times more likely to employ Māori than non-Māori owned businesses are, which is a great thing for increasing uh, employment of Māori. And yet, uh, Māori businesses at a statistical level are far more likely to be smaller and are in most cases less profitable and therefore more prone to uh, economic shocks. So Mason Jury, one of our top Māori leaders, proposes three goals for Māori educational advancement. And I think that these are also relevant for this session. These three goals are around uh, for Māori to be able to live as Māori, so comfortable within their own culture and worldview, to actively participate as citizens of the world, increasingly becoming relevant when we consider the nature of globalization, and thirdly, to enjoy good health and a high standard of living very much in alignment with uh, the economic challenge we've just been talking about. So I think that these three goals are a useful starting point for us to reflect the different dimensions of the challenge ahead of us. And so just to summarize um, sort of some of these, these thoughts and this framing, we're facing here an economic challenge, not just a social one. And let's be real about it. This is not a romantic situation that we find ourselves in. This is going to be something that's very difficult for us to address. We're talking here about reversing generations of discrimination, of colonization, of neglect, of um, lack of good solutions, lack of coordination. But if we can catalyze success here for Māori households and whānau and young people, then we can create another type of intergenerational change and hopefully bake in success and opportunity, which will benefit New Zealand, really will, will help New Zealand at an economic level moving forward. So we're not unmindful as those of us who already are grappling with these, these issues on a day-to-day, -day, and we have many speakers um, and um, grassroots leaders, Māori leaders on the call with us today. We're not unmindful that addressing this issue is gonna take many different types of stakeholders. It's gonna take on the ground initiatives. It's gonna take our schooling system. It's gonna take government and policy change. It's gonna take philanthropy and social investment. It's gonna take mental health practitioners, research institutes, unions, industry, employers. And this is where you come in as fellows, as a global group of change makers who can look at these, the, the nature of this issue from different lenses and help us with identifying uh, what is needed so that we can properly address it. And, and ideally, we invite you to actively be part in helping uh, change the narrative. So while we know that we can't tackle this in one session, um, we're going to focus on two parts and uh, two particular areas in this session to then set the context for further discussion. So those two areas is firstly, we're going to um, look at some, some actual initiatives uh, that, are, that are actually happening and we're going to do some work on those initiatives. We're going to be able to contribute our thinking to them. And then we're also going to be able to look at it from a, from a collective perspective. So what is the coordinating framework that we need in place so that we can create stronger alignment and impact around this issue? We've got roughly two and a half hours on the run sheet. That first hour, we're going to spend setting the scene and kind of understanding it, um, not only the challenge, but also the future forecasting, you know, what that could look like. And we have two speakers, Iruera and Hine Ponamu, who are gonna to speak to us about this and then have time for Q&A. We can have a five minute break after that first hour, and then we'll hear from four Maori initiatives that are active and that are geared up around aspects of the solution to addressing this particular socioeconomic challenge. And then after we've heard from these initiatives, then it's really a chance for us as fellows to break out into groups, uh, two, breakout group, two breakout sessions. The first one is going to be focused around those various initiatives. So you pick one and it's a chance for you to contribute your thinking in groups with them. 
And then the second is to explore what a shared agenda could look like, where you see the gaps being and where you see us being able to create greater impact together. And then we'll just do a final wrap up around some of the actions. And that's gonna set the scene really um, with the intention for you to then be able to have the context, the awareness and the connections um, so that if you so choose, you're able to then be part of addressing this challenge beyond today. So Tatoma, uh, some context building to set the scene and to unpack the challenge for us a little bit more from a macroeconomic view and provide a little bit of the future projection of how we may address it. I'd like to introduce our initial two speakers, Iruera Prendergast Tarena and Hine Ponamu Apanui Pa. Now they come to us from Te Wai Ponamu, the South Island, from Tokona Teraki, the Māori Futures Collective. And this session sits squarely in the work that they do pretty much on the daily, mapping these, these problems, these challenges with solutions and how we wire those for equity. So for our audience, feel free to note your questions in the, the chat uh, that you have for Eru and Hine Ponamu, and we'll um, have a bit of a Q&A at the end. And for now, I'd like to hand over the talking stick to Eru Eda and Hine Ponamu. Nō reira, a tēnā kōrua. Tēnā koe, Shay, uh, Maui Wawahi te wahanga kia tato, uh, me te tukui to tato karakia, uh, me te tāhu hoki o te rongo i te reo te nōta, uh, uh, nā reire kara e mara, uh, te nā koe, uh, tai atu uh, ki o hoa, uh, ngā ringa ringa ngā wai wai o tēnei o ngā kaupapa, uh, hāpai ngā, ngā mano ko me ngā moe moe a o, o a pōpō uh, ki o te tuki pai, nā reire mihi kia koutou. Uh, ko Iruera Tārina tōku ingoa, uh, mai ngā iwi o Ngaitahu, uh, ngā te pau uh, me te whānau āpanui. So kia ora koutou, um, my name is Iruera Tārina, I'm the Kaihautu Executive Director of Togona Teraki, which is um, the Ngaitahu Social Innovation Lab. So uh, are you guys talking about collective impact, um, social innovation labs, we kind of do that, uh, that's our really our role with our iwi and providing a, a mechanism for iwi to facilitate collaborative partnerships and collaborative innovation using our own sort of mātaranga Māori. And so we kind of have uh, one piece of it is um, next gen solutions. So we work on a range of research and uh, um, collaborative projects. And then we also grow the next gen of our leadership and uh, growing an army of rangatahi future makers. So. On that, I'm quite obviously not rangatahi, so I'll pass to Hine Pānumi. Kia ora tātou. Otira ngā mihi nui ki a koutou katoa, ngā mihi nui ki a koe e hoa shai a otira ki tō tira mo tēnei o ngā hui, me tēnei o ngā kaupapa, tēnā koutou, ko Hine Pānumi tōku ingoa, he uri tēnei no ngaitahu ngā te porou me ngā te hine. Kia ora everybody, as Edu mentions, my name is Hine Ponamu and I am one of the rangatahi, uh, one of the youth that works here at Tokona Teraki. Uh, there are 11 of us that work here as part of our organisation. And as Edu mentioned, uh, it's trying, the whakaro, the idea behind it is trying to grow a generation uh, of young people trained uh, in social impact and collaboration. So um, I really enjoyed your kōrero shay about the waves and that's our, that's our daily business. We, we know that Māori are often you know, the worst impacted by those huge battering waves of change and what we focus on and what we work on here at Tōkona Teraki is influencing the tides uh, and influencing the conditions of the waves to ensure that our people have the ability uh, and the tools to surf them, to surf the waves of change um, and also to front foot them. So we have some slides to share with you all. Um, we have a piece of work that we have been undertaking in the last uh, year around the future of work for Māori, but I find myself very privileged um, to say that equity is my day job. Um, I, yeah, I'm one of the, the researchers in our team. And yeah, I'll let you do, I'll let you do introduce, introduce us last. Yeah, just sort of really taking an equity lens. And I suppose when you think about the future, um, there's a, 
uh, a, a beautiful writer, thinker, and scholar, Sahail uh, Anayat Tola, like a Muslim futurist. And he just has this beautiful fakaro that, um, yeah, if the future is just an aspect of the present, and even just by thinking about the future, we're changing it. So when we think about it, our, our tupuna, yeah, they were future makers, and we've been through a process where we've forgotten that, and so we've been decision takers. And so rather than sort of um, reacting to all of these fear-driven narratives around a burning platform, uh, around we've only got 12 years left, that these are things that yeah, actually can be quite weaponized against our communities where our people um, have this idea that their future is set in concrete. Yeah, and rather than thinking about, well, the future is something we make, and so how do we elicit rangatira tanga and agency and get back into that space? And I think Shay um, pointed that out beautifully. It's really hard to think about thriving when you're surviving. Mm -hmm. So how do we reclaim some of that tupuna way of thinking uh, about owning the future and being a ngāti ākōpō, the, the tribe of the future? Um, I'm a waka nut, uh, um, and we often have battles where we try to sort of use metaphors uh, for different kaupapa, and I always lose, uh, um, but I drew this slide, so I get to put waka in there. But yeah, when we, we look at that, um, when you think about our whakatauki, te te tiro whakamuri, ka haere whakamua, ka mua, ka muri, uh, um, all of these framings around looking back to move forward, and so when we think about equity, you know, and we talk about that in an aspirational sense, and we are very lucky because our, our job is to kind of go, well, okay, how do you make that shit happen? And, and how do you break that into bite-sized chunks? But yeah, our tupuna wisdom says, well, the first thing you do is you look backwards. So we can talk in an aspirational sense in Aotearoa about wanting an equitable Aotearoa. We're pretty bad at talking about, well, how do we create inequity in the first place? And what are we doing today to sustain that? And a beautiful quoted or by a relation, uh, Hannah O'Regan, who's the chief executive of Core Education, and is just a Naitahu Wahine superstar in general. But you know, she traced the whakapapa back to the 1860s, you know, where um, when we talk about the Māori economy and the Māori workforce, and Shay is absolutely right, you know. I hate the term, but you know, half of our people, uh, you know have been deprived of a, a qualification. Half of our people are in low skill, low pay, high vulnerability work. And unsurprisingly, half of our people are in occupations that are gonna be most negatively impacted by the anticipated changes from the future of work. So these things didn't happen by accident. And right from the 1860s, you had overtly racist government policies where the intent was to create a blue collar workforce and yeah, all, all based around racial uh, inferiority, you know, oh, sorry, superiority to go, well, Māori will, will make their, their means by manual labour, not mental labour. And so a lot of those overtly racist ideas uh, have been embedded and have become cultural norms. And so even Māori today, we say, you know, we're good with our hands. Yeah, we're good in team sports, good on the guitar and a good laugh. But they go, well, you yeah, know, your hands are operated by our heads, you know? So we have this idea deeply embedded in our culture and our society and policy that Māori make good labourers, but aren't capable leaders. And, and when you look at the implications of that, and I'm not gonna get into all the deficit stats of today, because yeah, we're surrounded by that. But I think, yeah, again, Che pointed at that key point to go, well, the implications of those racist policies and racist practices, have created racial disadvantage and racial inequities today. And I'm not gonna speak to that because that's just well evidenced and I'm sure we all can rattle off a bunch of statistics and evidence around that. The key thing Shay pointed out is, okay, well, what about our future trajectory? So that's the weight of our past. We know that's pretty heavy stuff, but when we're looking ahead, as Shay pointed out, yeah, we are gonna be the, the booming uh, um, population of the future. Um, we had our um, former uh, Kaifaka Haere, uh, Ta Mark Solomon, who used to do his 2050 speech and say, you know, that um, half of the workforce in 2050 will be Māori, Pacifica, and Asian. And absolutely right. 
And when you look at that today, to go, well, for every Pākehā baby being born, there's a Māori baby, a Pacifica baby, and an Asian baby. And when you look at, uh, we did some work around uh, features that work for Māori, a report called Whānau, I uh, saw the same stats that came out recently with a Westpac report with Bill, that, you know, the Māori workforce uh, grew by 40% between 2013 and 2018. At the same time, the, the non-Māori workforce grew by 8%. So you can see there's this phenomenal brown population bubble that's coming through. And that for us, yeah, is a massive driver in terms of change. So when we think about climate change, when we think about globalization and technological change, I think for Aotearoa, just as significant is this population demographic and really that demographic dividend to go, well, okay, uh, how do we see the, the strength and opportunity of a younger, faster growing uh, browning workforce. And when we think about the, um, the idea of, you know, if you've ever heard the whakatauki, uh, ko te pai tawhiti whaia kia tata, ko te pai tata whakamaua kia tina, like strive for distant shores, but cherish the ones you attain. You know, te pai tata is like a probable future to me. So you go, well, that's where we're currently heading. And so if you just think about that and you go, well, yeah, if our population uh, is going to grow by 80% by 2040, then you know, if we keep doing what we're doing, we can expect that a lot of those inequities will grow by 80%. The reality of it is actually they'd grow by 100% would be my uh, not superly uh, sophisticated guesstimation, but because you know, of, our, of our younger population who generally tend to have a higher level of vulnerability. So our youth population actually doubles by 2040. So when we think about that, that te pai tata, you know, um, our current uh, pay gap for Māori is 2.6 billion. You know, by 2040, that would grow to 4.3 billion. Uh, uh, some of the forecasting work. And so you can kind of see that for that pai tata, even just the status quo is not viable. Uh, it's not moral in the sense of if we are to be inspired and committed by values of a, you know, a fair and just society, but it's also not economically vi viable. And as we sort of say, you know, with growing inequity, we also have to acknowledge that that's not a brown problem, problem that's an Aotearoa Inc. problem. And we've had this idea of, you know, separate fates that, you know, well, Māori are inferior, Māori are a minority, and they are the cause of their own problems. You know, we blame poor for poor people for being poor. And uh, I'm sure anyone <laughs> can look on social media, hit any post of our Māori or vaccination rates at the moment and see just that racist vitriol at the moment that is totally framed uh, around, um, you know, blaming Māori for their own circumstances rather than looking backwards and understanding our historical context and the whakapapa of these issues, which are deeply embedded and are systemic, not around personal choice. So coming back to that, that kaupapa and thinking about that te pai tata our expected future, but really starting to flag to our, our Pākehā whānau to go that actually the, the fate of our younger, faster growing browning workforce is, is inextricably tied to our also growing, aging Pākehā workforce exiting the world of work and hitting retirement. And that whole idea of um, Pākehā baby boomers' expectations that yeah, they will get their super end because they paid their 40 to 50 years worth of taxes, when the reality of it is, well, it doesn't work like that. And you're going to have a young brown workforce that are going to be paying those taxes. And if we want to have a healthy tax bloat to support the burden of an aging Pākehā population, then we're going to need to have a, yeah, a young Māori thriving workforce, yeah, living good lives yeah, and jobs for the future, jobs that can support a whānau and jobs that offer opportunities for progression. And, and that's a really different setup uh, from our past. And so really when we think about that, the opportunity of an equitable Aotearoa, an equitable future, but understanding what well, our current trajectory is heading towards inequality plus, how do we start to map where we want to be? Uh, what does that island look like? And understand the changes that are needed uh, to change our course. Um, I'll just 
briefly talk, but uh, again, um, yeah, when we think of, of our people, uh, um, when I think of forecasting, you know, our people were at some point on an island in the Pacific, uh, and our traditions down here, we call it Te Patu Nui O Ayo, and this idea of uh, Te Waku Huru Huru Manu, that our, our people looked at the horizon, always imagined there was something beyond it, um, but didn't have any real world evidence, uh, um, didn't have a map or any coordinates. And so the tradition states that we built a canoe out of feathers and then cast that across the horizon. And eventually uh, that waka, uh, te waka huru huru manu returned from the heavens and it was all battered and ruffled. And what everyone took that as a sign of is that there is there are storms, there is chaos, there is life and energy and potential beyond the horizon. And I always love our tupuna kōrero because when you think about that, you know, the metaphor of, you know, a canoe of bird feathers. But if you're on an island and you watch a flock of birds head off in the same direction every time of year, and then six months later, they all come back from the same direction, then you know there's something out there. And so even though we might not be able to uh, clearly articulate what an equitable Aotearoa looks like today, we know it's possible and we know it's beyond the horizon. And the thing with our, our tupuna is they didn't wait for the island to bump into them. They pushed beyond the horizons, beyond their known. And that's what you call discovery. And, you know, that's, I think, a really good metaphor for innovation. To go, well, how do we get to somewhere we haven't been yet? How do we achieve a state we haven't yet experienced as people, as peoples in Aotearoa and an equitable Aotearoa? So... That's often termed seeing the island. And I think that clear idea that if you don't have a picture of where you're going in your head, then you're definitely not going to get there. And I think as Shay said, we haven't created the spaces as tertiary partners to be able to dream and to imagine where we want to get to. We're always in the business of reacting to the present, trying to work through the shit and trauma of the past but actually go, how do we create some space to just dream and imagine of the present? Because again, if we don't have a plan, we're never going to get there. And particularly for Māori, yeah, if we don't have a plan, we're just part of someone else's. It's always so hard to follow that. Uh, <laughs> Peter was talking about somehow he loses out on, on the waka metaphor, being a part of our projects. This is one of those projects. Um, so this is Te Whare Toto Pukinga, and it's our Tupuna Tiraki, our Aotearoa version of the Skills Clustering Report um, that came out, the New Work Mindset Report that came out from the Foundation for Young Australians um, and we've kind of adapted that idea and tried to back it up with uh, some data that's relevant to Māori, especially in the workforce, but also our New Zealand workforce. So what you see on the screen is the seven um, skills clusters or job clusters, seven job clusters. And they show the there's an algorithm uh, that is used to cluster jobs based on the similarity of skills required for those jobs. And the idea behind it is, um, I might just go back, but we know that these winds or these waves of change uh, are coming and they're coming fast. Uh, we have, you know, technology kind of rapidly changing the way we work. We have climate change, uh, globalization, all these things are affecting the security of jobs and the security of employment. But um, what we do know is there's an increasing need for agility. Uh, there's an increasing need for a diverse portfolio of skills. And uh, the skills cluster or job cluster methodology speaks to the idea that um, it should be theoretically easy for people to gain upwards mobility or switch careers if something is to happen. Um, so this is, we, have, we got Bill to harvest some Māori data um, and also data on the different skills clusters in Aotearoa. So what you see on the bottom, on the bottom bar are the, different, are the different clusters that exist. Uh, and what we see is the cluster growth 
um, is different for each. So we know that jobs um, in the digital IT tech sector, there's a huge growth in that cluster. Uh, same for designer. So that's um, the use of STEM to design or produce uh, buildings and, and other materials. There's a huge growth in those different clusters and there has been from 2013 to 2018 and there will be in the future. What we also see is that the share of Māori workers uh, almost sits at a kind of opposite direction to the trend of growth. So Māori are highly overrepresented in our artisan and generator clusters, um, making up the majority of our manufacturing, production, labour workforce. Uh, and we know this, but what is um, worrying, I guess, is the really low share of Māori workers in our high growth clusters currently. So on the designer and technology clusters, um, we are heavily, heavily underrepresented in those in those areas. Uh, what we know though and what we've talked about today is as much as there is a bit of fear and worry about the changes in the future, um, we, there are also plenty of winds of opportunity. So as Shay and Edu have talked about, we have the opportunity to front foot that change um, and to start designing the conditions for the future that will make a more equitable future of work, not only for Māori, um, but for all of Aotearoa. Just add there too, um, you know, simply put, you know, Māori have always been last on and first off, you know, that we're always um, hit first, hardest and longest in terms of an economic speed bump or recession. But also when we have economic booms, we're the last to, if at all, to benefit. And so when we think about a conversation around the, the future of work, which is really just the future, uh, um, whether it be an economic lens, a social lens, uh, um, a skills lens, what Hine Ponemu has been doing is trying to figure out, well, what's one shift that we can control? Uh, and even just that simple thing from shifting our mindsets uh, uh, from quals to skills is kind of key. But then I think in terms of the bigger kopapa is about, well, how do we start to put Māori and equity and, and social just uh, um, values to the fore of our conversations around the future of work? So that it's not a, a narrative driven around technological changes that happen to us, but really about us making, deciding what's the future we want and creating a clear pathway so that rather than being buried by those waves of change, how do we give all the whanau a nice long board, teach them how to paddle, and, and then we can ride that energy towards a better future. And again, that key thing of like that, here we tahi tato, you know, the he tangata ke tato, that idea of separate fates, that to go, actually that's not true, and that what's good for Māori mm -hmm. is gonna be good for Aotearoa Inc. And how do we kind of get on that same double hold waka to get us there? Yeah, and I think speaking about the winds of opportunity, um, what we know is there is, you know, compared to the last graph around the low share of Māori workers in those high growth sectors or clusters, um, there's a higher growth rate within the seven clusters of Māori in general. And if you look at the design cluster where Māori are heavily underrepresented, there's a huge growth, more than double the growth in that cluster than there is um, of, of all Aotearoa. And it kind of speaks to that idea of Māori are going to increasingly become the backbone of our working population. Um, and it's when we look at the kind of shifts that need to happen, um, so we know that our pai tawhiti, you know, is an, is an equitable Aotearoa, but how do we get there and what shifts need to happen? Uh, we know that mindsets need to shift between a kind of linear, um, what do you want to be when you grow older? You go to university to study that and you work in that area for life. That's shifting to what skills do you have in your kite? What skills do you have in your portfolio and how does that give you longevity uh, and, and stability in your career? So uh, our, the data shows that Rangatahi will have 18 jobs across five industries in their life. So that's a lot of jobs and a lot of industries. 
um, and that again speaks to the need to be agile, to have a diverse uh, range of skills, and it's not to dismiss um, qualifications, but it's to think at the moment our the entry into high level skill, or high skill jobs is really over credentialized, and how do we open up those gates to allow for equity? We know that most Māori don't go to university. We know the, the university rates for Pacifica are still really low. So how do we still ensure that those demographics have equal access to high skill educate or high level education and high skill jobs? Um, and for us, that's a shift from a qual job mindset to a skills career mindset. Uh, we also know that. You know, in the future, it's going to be more and more important to recognise lifelong cyclical learning, that we are never going to know enough uh, to sustain a career for the rest of our lives, but we will have to continue to train, continue to develop our kite of skills uh, to remain employable and to remain uh, in jobs that, that, you know, give us longevity. The key thing we can guarantee is that the pace of change is exponential. So our challenge then becomes, how do we support whānau to adapt to that change and thrive into that future rather than getting buried by it? And just that simple idea of being educated and having a qualification and having a qualification as the price of entry into the future mm -hmm. of work. Well, if we have historic inequities, then we are immediately screening out and excluding 90% of Māori who don't go to university. So how do we have a different mindset, a different cultural practice, different recruitment processes, different data tools, different structures and funding mechanisms so that we're building a new type of skills infrastructure that is built around lifelong learning and adaptation uh, to change as opposed to get your ticket and get in or don't. And just, just that last thing. So again, um, that idea of yeah, uh, the weight of our past and Māori being the, the factory worker, the labourer, yeah, that blue collar, low cost uh, um, workforce to go, that's what those policies and those ideas that do stem from, as I said, that kind of idea of human hierarchies uh, uh, um, yeah, and, and racial superiority, that's where the whakapapa of this problem comes from. And so how do we flip that and at least acknowledge to go, well, if we keep uh, sustaining these ideas, we are going to see racial inequities grow, but also that that intergenerational disadvantages is not just going to hurt Māori, it's going to hurt everyone. And really, when we think about that, we can now start to use data, which uh, um, yeah, uh, Hini Ponamu is working on, start to look at, well, where are these opportunities going to be? How do we create enterprise skills and make that a normal uh, um, toolkit for our, our rangatahi in our country so that when they have good enterprise skills, no matter what's hot, they can bounce and thrive. So these are highly transferable skills. In particular, looking at, at Shea, but also for us, this idea that you have to leave your culture behind in order to move forward, We've already seen that the most in demand skills are those human skills, you know, collaboration, teamwork, uh, critical thinking, communication skills. And when we look at our Māori values, it's like whanaungatanga and mahitahi is the secret source that is actually owning our cultural strengths, are the things that set us up. And already seeing that in the market where technical skills are depreciating because they're getting eaten up by. AI and automation, and it's actually those uniquely human skills that no matter anyone that's done collaboration knows, there's no way an app or an algorithm is ever going to figure out how to get your aunties talking to your uncles. And that's the, the complexity of humans. So how do we embrace that and actually get rid of this sexist language around soft skills and, and really start to think around how do we embrace these human skills because to go, they're the ones that are going to set us up for the future. And uh, um, but just yeah, again, trying to, to summarize that, how do we start to have that conversation? 
where we can actually wānanga, what's the future we want? And in particular for our um, perspective of things, how do we look at things like, uh, um, if I go back to that pink bridge, yeah, when we talk about ideas of equitable futures, how do we kind of build those tatidity based bridges to get us there? Because coming back to that idea of a shared fate, you know, I've heard, I think Tahu Kukutai called it a demographic dividend, but you know, just the end game where equity for Māori is equity for everyone. You know, it's an equitable art at all where we're all doing good, we're all living our lives. You have a dream that you know, every whānau can own a home and it's not like one person owns 40 and it's 29 others are renting. So how do we kind of think about what's the economy we want, what's the society we want, but our assumption is that, you know, we're all going to need to hold hands and go on that journey together and what would that tatidity based bridge look like to get us from that pai tata to the to pai tafati? It should have probably been a waka rather than a bridge, but um, yeah, kotato tira. So me paka hoki te raka korero ki a koe, shei. Oh, te na koe, te na korua. Mo ene i whakaaru whakaputa ki a mātou i pāna ki tēnei take nui ki a tātou katoa. Hey, so now uh, we've got some time for questions um, and I've got a few of my own that I've written down. Um, I think there's a few in the chat um, and now welcoming the space for for other fellows as well to contribute any part I put in the chat or feel free to use the raise hand mode um, if you've got questions for Hineponamu and Eriwera. Um, maybe if I just kick off um, to you both, uh, one of the questions I have is um, around what's the size of the challenge here? Like just for us to get a sense of, of the number of whānau that we're projecting to be um, seeing as um, those that we need to be working with. And given that we have different um, uh, outcomes that are forecasted for various whānau, you know, we have some Māori families that absolutely are at the front end of change and leadership, and then we have others who are swallowed in the storms of this stuff. Um, what, what do you sense to be the size of the, the, the challenge here that we need to be thinking about and um, is it going to be that we need to be focused particularly on some, or is this something that needs to be considered for all Māori moving forward? I just probably, um, I often get told off by one of our sort of kaumātua, but um, for talking about equity, and he goes, well, that's not what we're about. And we always sort of have that discussion and to go, yeah, that in destination, that Hawaii hall, it is rangatira tanga, yeah, moving from dependency to self-determination. But I think equity is useful because it's kind of a marker of our progress on the journey. And, and so equity is measurable. So if we think of what would equity for Māori look like, um, I think it's around 33,000 Māori transitioning from low skill to high skill jobs, um, additional 50,000 Māori attaining a tertiary qualification, and then a further additional 50,000 Māori attaining a level five plus and stuff like that's tricky because we don't want to kind of plot our trajectory in the future based around the stuff that's easily measurable in the past and the present but even in our own takiwa just for Maitahu we know that you know equity would mean supporting an extra I think it's around 300 rangatahi to exit school with university entrance every year and support an additional 6,000 of our whānau to transition into those high skill, high pay, high security jobs for the future. So the scale is pretty huge, bro, uh, um, long story short, but I think equity is useful in that it's something that we can measure. And again, it, it kind of when you, when you have that kind of bigger picture measure, it shifts the frame to look at the sort of societal and systemic lens as opposed to going, you know, blaming whānau, um, you know, poor people are poor because they make bad decisions. When you look at that big picture, you can spot patterns and there are really massive patterns in there based around, you know, cultural stereotyping and, you know, racial bias. So that's what's useful is using equity as a target to measure our progress towards that rangatira tanga. Yeah, I, I would just also add, um, as well as the data that shows us the scale of the issue, um, a lot of the work we do is talking to rangatahi and talking to whānau and focus groups and in different types of 
qualitative um, you know, research methods to understand, I suppose, the impact of the issue. Um, and regardless of how many people are impacted you know, by, um, by what's happening in our education and employment space, it's actually the issue itself that is the size of the issue, if that makes sense. Um, we hear from rangatahi who, you know, have been really heavily um, undercut by our education system and really struggle to find their way into meaningful or just employment uh, in general. So the size is absolutely huge and we can we can plot projections and data, um, but it's also about whānau showing up for each other and, and iwi Māori organisations showing up to pull our rangatahi and to pull our whānau uh, into better positions as well. Well, I think um, just hearing the articulation of yes, equity is a useful uh, proxy for measuring progress towards self-determination, that's, that's an interesting. I think for me, hearing the scale of the challenge reflects the idea that this is systemic. If we're talking about tens of thousands of of um, Māori moving from low school to high school jobs and needing to be, you know, transitioning into attaining certain kind of qualifications to be primed for that future workforce, um, then, you know, that really... Oh, am I back? Your sounds sounds funny now. Can you try again? About now. Is that better? That's good. Thank you. Oh, bye. Yeah, the, the nature of the, the scale of the challenge you reflected there, Eruera, where we're talking about tens of thousands of Māori whānau uh, or individuals needing to, well, you know, transitioning from low-value work to high-skilled work uh, into greater qualifications that are primed for the future, that to me reflects that this is systemic and that we need to consider then massive change, massive systemic change to be able to rise to that. This is we're not talking about small little initiatives here that can work with 10 or 20 or even 100 whānau members. We're talking about what that can look like at scale. And so whether that is deeply embedding um, institutional and systemic change or whether it is about better weaving together many grassroots initiatives that can speak to local context, but in a way where we can then have a dashboard across, you know, um, the, the, the kind of the macro trends, um, either of those two is going to be really important. And that's kind of what this session is about, to look at how are we going to be able to rise to that you know, that, that the level of the, the, the challenge that you just put forward. And that was only in relation to Māori statistics, of course. We have Pacific Afano, uh, we have other uh, ethnic minorities that are in a similar position in terms of needing, um, you know, being part of that demographic shift. Um, so, um, are there any other apartheid from fellows? I noticed there's one there from Rosalie. Uh, Rosalie, would you like to unmute and ask your question, please? Just as I was listening, um, and I wondered if there is an opportunity for Rangatahi and Pacifica bringing a really different and a learner's mindset to actually leapfrog so that it's not a situation of equalizing, but actually leaping ahead with skills for the future and a mindset for the future that is really based on that collective impact. Because I think um, so many of us are recognizing that the industrial hierarchical modes of leadership that we've grown up with um, and have been embedded in our business environments are not fit for the future. And so my question was, is there an opportunity for us through supporting Rangatahi and Pacifica to actually show a, a new direction and a new path? Yeah, I would say, and uh, absolutely, there's absolutely um, opportunity, and it's a great facade when we think of, Edu was talking about really, um, you know, maximizing those cultural strengths, and as part of the research that we shared, mm -hmm. we did focus groups um, with different groups of rangatahi and young people, and predominantly in the rangatahi Māori group without a qualification who had found employment they made a really interesting observation that one of their own view of their key transferable skill they had learned throughout their life and their journey through work was actually manakitanga, 
Um, mm. So their ability to not only look after people, but to look after kaupapa, to look after spaces and programs um, that is, you know, kind of innate for Māori, but was a key skill that they, they viewed as making them really employable. And mm. within, um, I think there are a lot of different cultural strengths, a lot of different inherent Māori values and Pacifica values mm. that are also key leadership skills. Um, that absolutely kind of open that that possibility, as you said, to leapfrog um, and really leverage off those enterprise collaboration skills. Partly too, I mean, um, kind of created an academy, which loosely is just, mm -hmm. we're just giving it a go. So we thought, well, we, we keep hearing all this stuff around skills for the future and, you know, all that sort of collaborative problem solving. And we our guess was, well, if we can figure out a mātaranga Māori way of doing it, that'll work better. And then we just thought, well, let's uh, um, hire a bunch of rangatahi full-time and try and figure it out. And um, hopefully it sounded like it was a bit more planned than that. <laughs> Not really. But, um, yeah, you learn by doing. And we're definitely learning heaps. And so from a pakeke perspective, yeah, we're seeing the value of that you know, and that who better to be shaping the future than those that will still be around. And also that we can always view that as not having 20, 30, 40 years experience, but also 20, 30, 40 years of institutional baggage, yeah. you know, yeah. and not have to navigate the loss. And so for us as Pākehā, we're figuring out how to rewire an organisation uh, to, you know, to be based around that sort of skills, collaborative problem solving, agile, adaptive, and, and that's working well. It has its ups and downs, but I think that's kind of a key piece is if we want that transition, we've got to build the waka to get us there, mm. not just have yeah. the crew. Mm. Oh, I noticed a question, uh, a raised hand there from Adam, one of the international fellows. Adam. Yeah, um, I've been... I, I, I want to lower the hand. Yeah, I really appreciate this discussion. Thank you, Shay, for bringing this, and Ants and everybody for bringing this discussion. I think this is an absolutely vital discussion that you're having, and it's and it's super exciting to me to um, um, have the speakers here speaking right now um, because this is exactly the work that I've been doing in the regenerative built environment. Is this visioning process of trying to understand what would or could we be doing and, and how, we, you know, it's like, it's like not envisioning the future. What the way I've been doing it is a little differently. We've been going backwards to the past and then forward casting to the now, but, um, but um, these kind of really um, core systematic changes. I mean, I've been studying the built environment in, in Aotearoa. And to me, one of the things that, that, that I see is a huge problem in Kiwiland, as it is in a lot of other uh, uh, British children, is that we look at our houses, our houses are, are, are our ego economic engines. It's the way we retire, it's the way we pass on wealth, and, there, and it's also the way that we show each other who we are. And if, if we, if we, there's no way to square that circle, that has got to go. And, and to see, you know, a vision of a decommodified land, right? And this is just a tiny little piece of the radical kind of change that we're talking about that has to be systemic with what's being thrown at us between now and 2050 in, in, the, in the climate wars. Um, you know, I just, I just think that, I think that, that pro uh, providing that radical vision of what could be as an aspirational thing, and then there's lots of ways and steps to make that happen. There's all kinds of cool um, built environment stuff going on amongst the Maori communities that I've been in contact with that are exploring um, on Fauna land, uh, some really revolutionary regenerative housing ideas and concepts. So, so like, like the, it's a matter of kind of linking for at least, and I'm only, I'm only, I'm only studying one tiny little, tiny little part of the whole picture, right? Just the built environment stuff. But to me, it seems like linking up some of the initiatives that with the vision is, and then, and then really, like it, it'll be an additive process. Like as you succeed, people are going to look around and say, 
what well we thought you were crazy for saying nobody's going to you know make their living off of their house because we're going to take care of each other and 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 you know we can we can adjust our houses to the size of families that we need and we can be agile within our communities knowing that we're going to have climatic change that's going to make us our houses much more movable and 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 much quicker to go up and down and and you know there's a lot of change coming for us and and like it, like the, the the future state of a um, climate resilient economy is based on um, redundancy and resiliency and and reinforcement and cooperation. And New Zealand is the perfect place to be the experiment for that because it's so far out from everywhere else, and it's so used to being out in its own walk in the middle of nowhere. And and the kind of change that's coming very rapidly in the West is going to really hit everybody hard. And so the quicker New Zealand gets on to this idea and what better way than have the young people of the of the young iwi envision this what this could what could the now look like if if if, if we had been able to adjust our path along the way with what we know now what could this now look like and then and then I I, I mean this is super I mean anyway thank you guys so much I don't know if there's a question in there but this is incredibly inspiring and it's exactly the work I'm doing and so if there's anything I can do to ever help, I'm an architect and I'd be happy to, to teach young ones about regenerative built environment. I'd love to engage with people that are in the teens that want to talk about design. And, and I'm also a builder of design and building and all that. I'm very inspirational, happy to do that. Awesome. And I think too, you go, yeah, in a, in a global context, inequality is, you know, is growing and within every, pretty much every country, but what can make us unique is that sort of tetidity superpower and to go yeah how can we start to figure out what does what do indigenous solutions to global problems look like what does tetidity based partnership solutions look like in terms of climate change so um, absolutely a uh, total mm -hmm. that for Karo and to go well that's something we can own in that tiny little motu in the bottom of uh mm -hmm. and Kia ora. Kia ora. Kia ora. Kia ora, Adam, for, uh, for that and reflecting that um, there are many different ways we can draw on Matauranga Māori to solve the social and economic challenges. And actually, we're going to have to use that as a methodology or as the way that uh, we, we bring about the future. I'm conscious of our time. There's, we, we're going to uh, move to for a five minute break. Um, but before we do that, Paula, could you launch a poll? I just want to get a pulse of how we're feeling about this particular challenge that we've heard set down and to see whether in fact we think it is one of the few things uh, that we should be focusing on around addressing um, for the, you know, for, for New Zealand in terms of an economic challenge. So Paul's gonna uh, uh, launch our poll, just take that very quickly and then we'll just have a five minute break before we move into our next phase of um, the session, which is going to be looking at some of the initiatives that are doing the mahi on the ground to address this stuff. And I'm also conscious that there were some questions which uh, fellows have been wanting to ask and haven't been. I do think that they are relevant, that they can be posed later in the session to the broader uh, group of initiatives as well. So we won't lose those questions. We'll just um, hold them for later. Kia ora, Paula. Uh, some reason it says that the policy act is not available. I uh, see. Oh, yep. Uh, I can see it on my screen. Can you? Who has got her hand up? So I think there's at least a few of us. Kapai, all right, there we go. Oh, great. Hey. All right, so we'll just hold it open for another 20 seconds and then Paula can give us a feel for how we're seeing this issue amongst us. All right, Paula, what are we seeing? Okay, all right, well, it seems pretty convincing. 90% of us um, do see this as a key challenge. It, and I think for the 6% of us that think that there are greater economic challenges ahead of us, that is also a really important perspective to be bringing when we come into the conversation um, and towards our breakout groups uh, this afternoon. 
bring that perspective out because we need to hear it from all, you know from all angles. And if we're still not feeling convinced, also please ask the questions which will help elicit that um, so that we can really tease this out because it's a challenge that I believe we're all facing, but it's also a challenge that we all need to be cognizant of. And that requires us to have the right framing for people to be aware of it and to be um, understanding of how they can be involved in solving it. So let's just break for a short break. We'll be back at, um, we'll go for four minutes. We'll be back at 12, 12, uh, sorry, 1, 12. For those of you who are in New Zealand, four minutes time. Um, and uh, then we will have our four uh, speakers. All right. Kia ora, Shay. Just to let the people in the live stream know that we will now stop live streaming, given that we will do breakouts afterwards. Uh, for us. The more I realize how complex and multi-layered it is and how many different components of they need to be as part of an overall solution and how scaled this, this challenge is in terms of uh, the tens of thousands of individuals and Fano that we need to consider bearing in our mind when we, when we think about what the, um, the solutions might need to look like. Now, these complex challenges aren't often solved through one intervention, especially in the lives of young people. So we need to therefore consider what that pathway or the pathways uh, might look like and how various initiatives can be woven together and well coordinated. Um, I'm also con cognizant that there tends to be a lot of duplication and a lack of coordination that goes on around uh, community level initiatives. And each one of them typically is struggling for resources. Um, so how do we ensure that, that each can be resourced to deliver what it needs to as it contributes to the greater whole? Now, the nature of these kind of issues I'd like us to look at through a framework that I think can help um, with strengthening the coordination between these initiatives, and it's called Collective Impact. Many of you have probably heard about it. Eduera um, referenced it, and it's some of the work that they are doing uh, there with, in Tukuna Paraki and the Māori Futures Collectives. So I'd just like to, for those of us who are not um, intimately kind of aware about what collective impact is or the, the various principles that make it up, I'd just like to share a few um, high-level principles. And if we can keep these in mind as we um, consider the overall solution, the systemic change solution, um, that we will look at uh, later in, in, in the session. Uh, Paula, I'm um, just checking if you're going to be um, uh, recording for Facebook this next session, this next component. I'm recording, but I'm not live streaming anymore. Okay, sure. Okay, do you want to keep live streaming? Um, I, think, I think it would be helpful to. I think this is still a really important part of the session, which uh, people will be interested to hear. Sounds good having to do that now, but we are recording and we will then upload the recording all together on our YouTube uh, page. Kia ora, Paula. So just looking at collective impact. So uh, collective impact um, is really um, a model or framework um, that is premised on a commitment by a group of aligned organizations around addressing a social issue in a coordinated and structured way. So where we might have loosely um, cooperation or collaboration, collective impact really is about the disciplines uh, that sit behind it. And what it's proven to do is increase the chances of that collaboration being successful. Usually it involves a number of different kinds of organizations and individuals and funders and businesses and government all working together, tackling the same issue from different perspectives. And there tend to be these five conditions for collective impact to work. And we'll just unpack what each of them are. The first is a common agenda. So having a shared vision and common specific goals around what success looks like. 
Also in the common agenda is about having an agreed definition of the problems we're trying to solve. If we have different versions of the problems, then we can be off doing disparate activity. But when we agree on what the actual problems are, we can all align our efforts to solving them and playing different roles in solving those same problems. And then the third part of the common agenda is knowing who the outcomes are for that we're trying to, um, to generate this impact. So we're clear on who the target group is for that series of initiatives. The second is around shared measurement. So this is having a common set of agreed measurement indicators that reflect progress so that all of us, as we go about or embark on different parts of the, the agreed problem or uh, work towards the agreed goal, we are all using the same approach to tracking progress we're able to then share our measurements between different initiatives, and we're able to start to evidence what things are working and what are not, because we're using a common set of measurements, which is helpful for not only for um, holding us uh, each of the uh, components accountable, because in a collective impact model, every component is important to the overall success. But it's also helpful for sharing uh, knowledge and, idea <clears throat> and different ideas between the uh, initiatives. The third uh, of the principles of collective impact is around mutually reinforcing activities, which sort of is, is in three, three parts. The first is uh, making sure that we are identifying which activities make the most impact so that we only do the things that really matter, that 80-20 rule. The second is that we are figuring out the order of things that need to be worked on so that we're you know, kind of using a domino effect principle or working on the right things first. And then thirdly, that we are defining clearly the roles that each organization or initiative is going to hold so that we are carving up the workload uh, uh, and apportioning it to the right kinds of organizations. The fourth um, component of collective impact is around continuous communication. A lot of the time collaboration falls down because there's not a real strong discipline around communicating between all parties. And so collective impact really embeds that into the structure to make sure that there's an agreed approach for how we will maintain uh, communication, that we will uh, prioritize knowledge sharing between the different initiatives, that we will build trust and relationships so that we don't feel um, that we can't share anything, particularly any sort of bad news or failures that we're seeing, which is all part of achieving success in the long term and also um, identifying how we involve our communities and our core stakeholders in this communication. And that's not, so yes, that is our communities and, and in this case, it would be Māori and Rangatahi, but it's also our other kind of stakeholders, including government agencies and funders. And then the fifth component of collective impact here, just to reference, is uh, the concept of a backbone organisation, an actual organisation that has a dedicated role in serving the collaboration, which is important because if, if there's no one kind of there as the glue or the knitting to hold it together, then often uh, these, these initiatives um, kind of fall apart or, or don't maintain that same level of practice. And I'll just put on the screen here some of the work that that backbone tends to do around project coordination. Um, usually they're independent. Um, usually they would be selected. Uh, by the various members because they're seen as an honest broker. They have a dedicated team, sufficiently resourced. They tend to stay in the background uh, rather than sort of be, you know, the, the front and centre because success needs to be and credit needs to be um, felt by all of the members that are participating. And usually the greatest expense in a backbone organisation is around the people cost uh, and then costs of the systems, whether they be communication, management systems, engaging with uh, the community and administrative. <clears throat> so this gives us a sense of this particular piece here, which I don't feel when I look across our ecosystem, I think this is relevant as well for our conversation on Friday around the ecosystem. But when I think about our entrepreneurship ecosystem and when I think about the nature of our Māori community initiatives that are working with rangatahi Māori young people, I don't see there being a strong 
collective impact methodology used, nor do I see there being um, a backbone organization that facilitates a lot of that. So part of what we're wanting to do today is to evidence how we might use this collective impact methodology um, or whether there are any themes from it that can help moving forward and rising to the occasion. So now we are going to look at some of these particular initiatives that are already addressing uh, the challenge that we're seeing, or at least a component of it. So we have um, we have four of us, four that are going to present to us today. Um, generally, they are working in the space of enabling Maori and Pacifica youth to enter high value careers that are geared towards the future and they're integrating Māori knowledge. And that's been a particularly important lens that we've run over which initiatives we've showcased today. There are dozens and dozens of brilliant initiatives that are in some way connected to this challenge. And many of those, even if they're not presenting, um, are on the call today. And our fellows, our Māori fellows are holding some of these initiatives. The four we're showcasing today um, are addressing uh, what we think is kind of directly focused on this issue and integrate Māori knowledge. Um, they, they, where most initiatives tend to be regional, low scale and expensive to run, um, there are kind of a, a, a fewer number that we see that are really scaled up and that have quite set operational models um, and that are connecting learning and skill development to actual high earning potential. And so four initiatives that we're showcasing today, we feel are kind of reflecting that. Um, and so we, the idea is by amplifying the work that they're doing, um, then we're able to, as fellows, collectively contribute to pumping them up and also to looking at what a woven model might look like um, to uh, address the next challenge we're working on. So our first um, showcase today is the Puhoro STEM Academy, led by the CEO, Naomi Manu. And now that's STEM with two Ms. The second M is for Mātauranga Māori, or Māori knowledge. Um, and so Naomi, Naomi is going to share with us here the contribution that Puhoro STEM is making, how they measure their impact and where to in the future. Tēnā koe e te kura, Naomi. Tēnā koe te katsoa. He mihi tēnā ki a koe shei. Nau i whakatū whera tēnā i hui te karakea nō reira a kei te mihi. Uh, o tira ki a koutou katoa, uh, he mihi nui, he mihi roa, he mihi tiki tiki ki a koutou. Uh, it's lovely to be with you all today and to, to uh, have the opportunity to showcase Puhoro. So I'll jump right in and say that uh, Puhoro, we established Puhoro in 2016 in response to the disproportionate number of Māori who, young Māori who are engaging in science, technology, engineering and mathematics. Recently, uh, we added the M. It doesn't accurately uh, capture, um, you know, uh, uh, as a, it really is a visual representation of uh, the sophistication of Mātauranga Māori or Māori knowledge. And uh, so we wanted to visually represent that. So we added a, another M. But of course, uh, uh, we understand that uh, Māori knowledge uh, stem fits within uh, the broader ambit of Māori knowledge too. So uh, it's been quite uh, wonderful having some sort of visual representation uh, to, to make sure that we appropriately capture the sophistication of, of Indigenous knowledge systems, and in this case, particularly Māori knowledge systems. Now, um, we have uh, fewer than 2% of the scientific workforce uh, are Māori. And so we wanted to do something that was going to address that. And what we want, what we did was we established a long-term pipeline. So from secondary school, uh, in the last three years of secondary school, uh, through tertiary and into employment. And the reason we, we established this long-term pipeline uh, is for the reasons that, that Shay highlighted before around collective impact. It means that employers are participating uh, in this kaupapa or this program uh, and walking alongside young Māori from uh, secondary school all the way through uh, that pipeline. So that's a really important component here. When a student uh, registers with this program, 
and we register their, fa their family. So we see whānau as a key driver of success. Uh, and um, that's also an important component of what we're trying to do here uh, is to ensure that they have, our, our young people have success, uh, an environment that where they can succeed and where they can thrive. What we're also, uh, as we're going through this program, what we're also doing is we're re-engaging them often, re-engaging our young person in science, technology, engineering, mathematics uh, at secondary school. We're supporting them academically. We're also supporting them from uh, a, a Māori worldview and applying a Māori lens. So this very much is also about ensuring that they are anchored uh, with their identity and who they are, of course, that's building uh, their confidence and creating a more uh, an environment, a learning environment that is more conducive to their success. Uh, so that goes hand in hand, really, this academic support and, and this other work that we're doing around their identity. The other, um, the other part of, of this long-term program and where employees or industry uh, participants is they're participating in providing work experience uh, at secondary school, uh, internships at, at, uh, at, within tertiary, uh, so that we can establish a network and have our students, our young people uh, engaging and, and networking nice and early as well. So what we consider uh, Puhoro is, is it is a kaupapa Māori and a kaupapa Fano approach to STEM education. And in doing so, we're able to provide a more equitable uh, access, I guess, to, to STEM education. The, uh, in terms of how we measure success, measuring success uh, looks like uh, we, we run a whole lot of evaluations, both internally and externally. We measure success through uh, their achievement. Uh, we measure success through their participation in the program. We measure success around how um, their whānau are also participating in, in the program as well and how their whānau are engaging in learning. Uh, so, uh, and that, that's a key thing. We're running events where um, we're able to provide support for whānau to understand the complexities around the education system and uh, particularly uh, the qualifications framework as well. And the last thing I just wanted to, to say is we started this program with 97 students in the Manawatu area. Um, and we now have over a thousand students across the country in the program. Over the next five years, we're looking to expand the program to, uh, to 5,000 students. Um, so we've got this uh, program of growth ahead, ahead of us. Um, and that's one of our challenge. How do we grow at scale? Uh, how do we grow whilst maintaining the, the quality of the program as well? The last point to note is that uh, our um, Māori students uh, achieve parity, our Pūhoro students achieve parity with non-Māori students across the science and technology um, qualification framework, uh, and our students are five times more likely than other Māori students to um, achieve university entrance and go on to start a degree program if that's their aspiration. Um, no reira, uh, kei te mihi atu kia koutou katoa. Kia ora Naomi, hey, um, thank you for sharing uh, the context of it and also some of the, the numbers to give us a sense of the scale, 5,000 over five years. I'm also um, just interested to get a quick response from you around how do you value, how is, is the impact of Puhoro being valued um, and how do you know it's working? Great. In terms of uh, how we know it's working is we privilege relationships over everything else. Uh, so we build our relationships. We have very close relationships with our students. So the, the main indicator of, um, of, uh, of this working is uh, the very high level of engagement we have with our, with our rangatahi um, because this is about them and about their aspirations and what, we, what they want to do. And so we pivot uh, the delivery of our program based around what their aspiration is for their future. Uh, and um, how is it valued? Uh, I think um, an, a number of things, um, it, it's valued in a whole range of different ways. It's valued in terms of uh, externally, in terms of uh, being a something that is achieving parity uh, um, in education for our young people. Um, 
uh, that, that's a big one for our funders uh, because that's something that, that is easily, easily measured. Uh, in terms of, um, we, we also have this cost benefit analysis, another way that we, uh, we um, measure impact is we uh, use treasury modeling around the cost benefit analysis for the program. And we talk about investing in a structurally, structurally youthful population where we're going to see a return on that investment for the next 40 years when we're investing in our young people. Uh, and so uh, uh, the Puhoro program is valued at, at its most conservative levels at $92 million this year. And so, um, yeah, I, I guess in how the way that it is valued, I guess, with our external partners is we're doing something that hasn't been done before. Uh, and we have since the beginning um, been able to evidence our results as well. Mm, kia ora. Awesome. Well, there's, uh, there's one example for us if we're particularly interested in the STEM side of things and um, the way in which we might contribute towards that. Naomi will be um, hosting one of our breakouts afterwards, and so too will our other three uh, speakers uh, that are about to follow. So our second showcase for this afternoon is one of our own EHF fellows from Cohort 8, Ni Kora Naropo. Uh, from the tribes of Ngai Tuhoe and Te Rarua, and he's going to illustrate for us his initiative, Young Animators, uh, which is creating an end-to-end -end solution for youth to get into the animation, visual effects, and gaming industry. And Nikora is um, joining us from a very early morning in Dubai. So tēnā koe, Nikora, no mai hara mai. Well, I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, can you guys all see that? Okay. Um, so kia ora tato katoa. Uh, um, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, as, as Shane mentioned, I'm, I'm here in Dubai at the moment. It's a very early morning um, for me, so it's 3 a.m., but that's okay. Um, I'm here to talk to the co-papa and, and share some of the stuff that we're doing um, as part of ENMD. So to give you a little bit of context and background, um, I came from the visual effects industry uh, in, in a team of about 1,500 people, you'd have maybe five Māori. You know, we just weren't seeing our people come through the doors. Um, in 2015, I left that industry and started thinking about how can we take those principles, um, concepts, and turn them into an, an accessible program that our rangatahi could do anywhere in the country. So whether you're rural, whether you're based in the city or otherwise. And so we developed the program from the ground up. Uh, and, and part of the challenge was we just weren't seeing Māori move into these spaces. We were, you know, we were seeing really talented Māori who couldn't see a direction or a pathway um, for, that, for that creativity. Um, coming from the industry that I've spent the last 20 years in, you know, the pay is fantastic, the projects are amazing, but we didn't have enough role models in this space. We didn't see our people kind of coming through. So Young Animators was about taking those ideas out to the people, being able to do it regionally, um, and then inspiring them as well into these sorts of careers. So long story short, um, We've continued on with our program. We've been in 14 different regions around the country. Um, and we've been looking at this end-to-end -end solution. Like, how do, how do we take our rangatahi on this journey? Um, how do we get them to look at animation as not just the, uh, the skill set, but as the point to kind of open up everything else? Oh, is my feed, I'm not cutting out, is it, am I all right? Um, so with that, we kind of like, we, we looked, at, looked at the skill set, but we used that as a, a catalyst to look at coding, to look at visual effects, to look at different opportunities that could be integrated into these spaces. So coming from an artistic lens, but also looking at STEM technology and what was available out there. You know, not everybody's an artist, but there are so many parts of this pipeline where people can fit into. And that was the beauty about creating this particular program. So we've been 
going quite hard with this um, over the last few years. Um, we helped design and develop a new digital curriculum. But one of the one of the challenges we had there was, um, and I'll, I'll mention Paul Toa there. Paul Toa came to me with a, an amazing idea while I was helping develop the curriculum. But there was an in a there was a fear around ideas that were too progressive or, or moving too fast for those people who couldn't keep up with them, you know? And so we had great people bringing this Mato down. You know, they had a, um, I won't talk for you, Poto, you can, you can do that, but they had a relationship with Riot Games, um, which Aotearoa could have leveraged to put into the program as well. So, you know, we've had challenges at the government level around speed, implementation, um, trying to get uh, some of the skill sets that we that we see in these initiatives into the the staple mainstream education space so that our kids have access. Um, and as as you know, uh, the government space can can move quickly, but generally um, it's made for scale and not speed. You know, so we have the hook. We've been getting Nangatahi into that space, and that's that's been awesome. Um, we're enjoying that process. Um, so we are a team of passionate uh, animators, kaioko, teachers, mothers, uh, parents as well, um, who have kind of taken on this journey of looking at animation and bringing things through into the into that wider context of space. And I'm just looking at the time, I've only got like 40 seconds left. But in terms of an initiative, we, we would love to see um, support around and the skill set with EHF around logistics, long term strategy, um, connecting with different communities well, so that there is a voice coming through in that space, not just from the communities, but also from our different connections in the industry at a localized level. Like we have to make these things work at a local level. For, for our tamariki, for our kids to be able to see themselves in those spaces. And so I, I guess our big ask um, out to the community is, what skills do you have that, that you might be able to bring into the space? Um, administration, strategy, logistics, um, procurement, um, policy, where we can rally those skills um, and try and change things, not just at a federal government level, but at a localized level as well, so that we can create partnerships within the community. Um, where we're not just asking for a handout, but a hand in and everybody to come together and get on board. So I'll, I'll, I'll keep the time and I'll just cut it off there, but kia ora tata. Kia ora and you mentioned in there uh, Paul Taiwa as well. And so Paul Taiwa has joined us uh, from the Digital Natives Academy. So it's something that he founded, an initiative um, based out of Rotorua, but are now extending into other centres. And the Digital Natives Academy really helped Māori become leaders in the digital tech industry and creative industry and become future makers and innovators of technology. So tēnā koe e te tuakana Paul Taiwa. and cheers to all the cousins, you my man, bro. I've seen you, you could have, you know, uh, cousins, yes, sis, can you? Uh, cheers, my brother, say. Um, so just sending big, big mihi out to you from Rotorua Nui, uh, Kahu Matamomoi. Um, my wife and I, Nikolasa, we started Digital Natives Academy about seven years back. And it's our sanctuary in the heart of our city, where we inspire the next generation of digital leaders. Um, it, it, I'll rewind back to like 2011, 2012. Uh, our kids started jumping on uh, Minecraft. They were just bubbers, got two little bubbers, and um, Minecraft was their thing. And we said one day uh, for the birthday, I said, Hey, what do you want to do for your birthday? He goes, Play hey, Minecraft. So we got all of his cousins together and all of the tables, and we realized our house was too small and our internet wasn't that good. So we thought, How, how about we jump into 
But in the background, I've been a, a hardcore spacey player since a kid. We used to go and play all the all the arcade games at uh, the fish and chip shop, the Olympic Gear, and we used to dominate all the spaces, Rotoro, Hamilton, Christchurch. If we, we went, we could find a spacey pilot, play a bit of Street Fighter. And then because it was for us, it was just there was entertainment and escapism, but it was also that social connectivity for the fuzzies and spaces. Most of us were broke. If there was 10 of us, one might have 20 cents. So you are well, seconds. But just that love for uh, IT and for gaming always ran in my background. But I went to study at um, first Waikato University and in Canterbury University. That's why I'm moving to my very end to get to see other. And um, I studied politics. And over the years, I love politics, just being amongst it, process and stuff, but it's so negative. <laughs> And I come from Fort Bob Rotorua, and I, I, we've had enough. We've had enough of that negativity. So um, IT, and at that moment, something sparked in my head. We've been doing uh, tangatafenua.com, uh, our online party with Māori since 2002. In the background, just quietly sending positive whānui to anyone that we could. In the beginning, it was just 12 whānui, uh, just sending an email, and then by the end of the year, there were 1,200 on our email list. By the end of the following year, there were 2,000. And then the, the Hikoi came, and our list went to 10,000 people. Then the Māori Party came, our list went to 50,000 people, and they were all Māori. It was Māori from throughout the country. So I knew that we were all connecting, and we were using email at that early stage. But so... We were working with our tribe in 2004, 2005, post-settlement. And uh, a lot of our iwi had been working with the Crown to, to transition a lot of the services. So we have a, a website setting up databases for the uh, iwi around uh, here in Tarawa and Mātātua. And one thing we realised was there weren't a lot of Māori that could make websites back in 2004, 2005, or help us with databases. It was still a, a paper-based process. So we were putting people on Apple, FileMaker Pro, <laughs> setting up the basic websites, like WordPress, we're just using WordPress websites. And a kind of a confluence happened where we realized there weren't a lot of Māori in the IT industry, but we also saw that our kids were digital, their digital natives team had just been created. So we, we hired a small room, uh, got a poor half computer from the council, my wife, Nicole Lassie, and I's two computers. We shot off to the dump because people would dump computers like Christmas, chuck out all the computers. Uh, got a new computer, chuck it back, just chuck it out, please. So we harvested four computers out of the e-waste and then we opened up Digital Natives Academy just so our kids could first play Minecraft, little boha, <laughs> but then so we could start training them in the basics of code, uh, graphic interface, WordPress, and then that grew into coding animation, digital storytelling, which is quite important, and game development, esports, AR, VR. So in the last, every year we've added some new dimension, a new piece of tech. This is what we're playing with at the moment. Yes. Yeah, the quest to, I know, we'll get to that in the future anyway. So um, we, ours was about, uh, in 2010, I'd gone around with other Maori, looking for Māori in the IT industry. And we found about 500, I think. No one even, we, because most geeks are introverts, we just, if we get a job, we'll stick to ourselves. We don't go out and have parties. We're not like the Silicon Valley CEOs and drive flash cars. You know, we really want to stick to ourselves and be humble. And what I realized is just by connecting people in this group called the Digital Māori Forum, we could just talk. We could just like, hey, Kazi, well, what do you do? And so from DMF in 2010, we kind of snowballed into this um, using NetGui from Internet New Zealand, every possible opportunity for Māori to get together. That's why I'm a mihi to to Kane, to Rio, uh, to Nikura, because we, we were all alone until we found each other. And then once we found each other, we were across infrastructure, hardware, software, cybersecurity, and most recently, uh, content creation. Because most of our kids like their TikTok, their YouTube, and their Insta life. It's not me, but now I'm too old for their TikTok. 
but they're not stealing my dance So we have them. It's the dance But because we, we've had, we've got a lot of infrastructure, we've now got uh, tour tunnel, we can help our rangatai. And in Digital Natives Academy, we're taking hundreds of kids every week from every school, just to, first time they've, first time they've been into a computer lab, it's all LED lights and computers for days, they've got a computer chair, it's the first time they've been in those spaces. The first time they've switched on a PC. The first time they've got a headset. And then we get them on a Discord and Twitch and just start like connecting them with online communities. Because it's important for us to never let it be, be by themselves if they don't want to. If it's just about connection, how do you connect? Is it through Twitch? That's the gaming platform. Is it through game, uh, Discord? That's the online chat platform. Is it through Insta? Is it through TikTok? And then we bring them back to Digital Needs Academy and just start working together as a partner. Um, on Friday, we're doing a, a virtual reality wānanga, which is between us and Michaela Jade over in Australia. So our side has to put on headsets and do a pōhiri. <laughs> it's going to be fun as. <laughs> and then our Aboriginal cousins will we're trying to understand the rituals of engagement and encounter. How do how do our First Nations whānau greet and how do we greet? And, and we'll, after our hour session, we'll write it down, and our elders will be there with us inside the headsets, and then they'll help us develop some new tikanga because this is a new place for us, and we need to keep our, our tamariki safe and our rangatahi knowledgeable. Because what happened when we were part of two degrees, uh, we helped launch the network, and then Steve Jobs put the, the cell phone, the smartphone in our hand, and that, that network exploded. And that was Māori based, that's not a, that's not a story most people know, two degrees as a papa papa Māori. And lots of Māori were in, involved in there at the beginning. That's where I started to meet all the geeks, it was like, yes! <laughs> but we got these phones and there was not a lot of ethics around them. And now all the years later, we're starting to see our tamariki are getting harassed, our rangatahi are getting bullied. And so because we've been put down digital ethics then, we're in catch up mode. So we're working with our alfano, our tamariki rangatahi and our kaumato just to lay down the ethics, you know, put down, lay down the law. But at least there's, there's one and where they can ask good questions, but here's our base understanding when we go into AI. We go into VR. So we, we make sure that our company are grounded here at home, have aspirations and dreams, because first, Māori don't dream, because we've been suppressed. Whānau, did you know they've been suppressed against us for 200 years? Oh, we're too kidding you. But we don't give ourselves permission to dream. And that, that's an intergenerational thing. And that's this generation now starting to dream, which will allow their whānau to dream. And we back ourselves. But it's all about connecting with, with all of the cousins that hold similar values. Yeah, so Digital Natives Academy here in Otterua, please come down when the lockdown or whatever. Yeah, lovely to meet you. Yeah, kia ora po taua. And um, it's interesting how you reflected there that, you know, humble beginnings then to VR headsets and now the technology is part of the portal for utilising my tauranga Māori and rethinking our tikanga and rituals of engagement. So these things are not set, they are fluid and technology in some cases is helping to create that fluidity. But, and I think because our whānau would lock down and we were always going to do this because some of our whānau in Australia still want to reconnect. But mm. now we, we have to stay in our, in our regions. How do we join a whānau? How do we learn our pipi, our waiata, how do we learn about our sites of significance? These, but I've not so much potential in the 5G space, for instance, like these did when we launched two and three G. But it's it's a gamble because these things are two thousand dollars. But we think that we can put these in the influencers' hands of our partner, like Pakeke, Komatua, and Rangata. You know, just one here, there, there, then go to that person if you need to be a part of that one. Just have them close. It's about access in the chain, but you're so other. We need more tools. Kia ora. Kia ora. Well, thank you for that, Porto. And now we have our fourth uh, initiative. 
presenting to us before we move into our breakout groups. And that comes in the form of Young Enterprise Trust, which delivers a range of entrepreneurship education uh, programs and competitions in high schools, and actually was a big part of inspiring my journey into entrepreneurship when I was at school. So here to talk about the nature of their work is their uh, Maori, uh, Head of Maori Engagement, Ian Masson. Tēnā koe, Ian. Uh, tēnā koe, Shay. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, how are we finally? Um, my name is Ian Masson, like Shay pointed out. I'm a coasty boy from down Ngāti Pro. So I've got a shout out to Kainan and, and Phil over there, um, especially some of the amazing mahi they do down the coast and part of Taiki and all that cool stuff. But yeah, finally, I had notes today and then I was listening to everything, our first session, the second session, and those notes just went out the door. And I think for most of us, that was the case. And so what I thought I would do is come on and speak more from a, we'll call it a heart perspective of what we do at Young Enterprise and what we're doing, what we hope to achieve and the impact that we intend to make in the future. And I guess to really kick that off, really want to acknowledge Potoa, Nikora and Naomi because the mahi that they undertake is incredible. And when I listen to them, I think, what more can we do at Young Enterprise? Um, now, to kind of frame things up for us, Fano, Young Enterprise, we're not a Māori organisation. Um, we don't claim to be, but what we do recognise, and I think what would become more apparent to us recently, is that we have a platform when we are, I guess we deliver entrepreneurial and innovation programs to 85% of Aotearoa's high schools. And as a result of that, we have a responsibility to do more for Māori. And so while we're not a Māori organization, we have reach. And with that reach comes a lot of accountability and also a lot of, I guess, need to do more. So similar to what Shay was mentioning, so I done Young Enterprise when I was at high school. Now, I'm not gonna tell you how old I am. I'm not gonna tell you what year it is. So you can take guesses, but we'll say it's still in the 2000s. So I don't go too far back. And it was a pinnacle part of me deciding what I wanted to do in my future. Now, it didn't, suggest or tell me that I was going to go into business, that I was going to study a certain thing. But what it did do for me is give me the confidence in myself. Um, now, the reason I say that is because some of the, the biggest concerns, how I recognize them, I think as many of our whanau on here have recognized it, is that there is, and I'm going to read this because I've written this part down, and I think it captures my thinking um, well in this space, is there's, we need to combat this kind of unfair, unwanted existing stigma. Okay, so we know there's an underrepresentation of Māori, but also our Pacific whānau, our lower income whānau, and I guess a whole range of different marginalised groups in entrepreneurial activity. And a lot of this persists from my perspective in part because Indigenous and other non-Western cultures have been stereotypically portrayed as being adverse towards excellence in these areas. Um, and as a result of that, those notions carry on to young people which then in turn reflects their ability of themselves, their self-identification, what they believe they can achieve. And as a result of that, they don't feel like they belong in such spaces. And so I think everyone on this call, including us at Young Enterprise, we all do it differently and we focus on different areas, but it's around how do we help our young people recognize their, the innate ability that sits within them to, and I don't use the word empower because I don't think we empower them. I think it already sits within them, but how do we help them to refine that? Um, to be able to go on and continue to do the incredible things that I think we, as people that have a little bit more maturity in terms of age, recognize in them, but they can't quite see in themselves. So Young Enterprise, in its simplest form, and from an external looking in, you might suggest that, okay, they help kids in high schools set up businesses. But for us, it's really around inspiring young people and unleashing future leaders. And we do that very much in, use, I guess, building skills. Yes, our young people do run a business while they're at high school but more so it's around empowering them with skills that we feel are gonna benefit them going forward into their future careers. And so it goes back onto um, Hene Ponomus and Eduwira's talk around, it's, I guess I've made this, written this down too, moving from quals to skills, helping our young people recognize the skills that they do have or they can grow into and how those will benefit them moving into the future. Um, I guess Fano is just to share a little bit about how we kind of measure some of the successes we have. You know, numbers are one thing, but they miss a narrative. Um, I think of what we, as a young enterprise this year, we have 4,701 students, okay, which is cool. We have about 18% of those are Māori, which is cool, but we also can then recognise there's so many gaps that we're missing. 
and so much more that we can do in order to actually make a, uh, a difference to more people. I, I look back at my journey with the Young Enterprise, Shane mentioned it with his, um, I guess, on his quarter intro to what I was going to talk around, the impact it had on our lives, but we also recognize that there's so many more young people that we can have an impact moving forward. I, um, I think I saw a question pop up. We got uh, 4,701 students to answer that question um, during one of our programs within Young Enterprise. And a portion of those are Māori, which is cool, but also it's about recognizing where those rangatahi Māori sit within the country, because a lot of them are, like Shane mentioned, in our bigger areas where a lot of Māori are. And then we want to really be supporting our whānau that are in our regional parts of Aotearoa as well to kind of build that ability. My, I guess my hope, and this is, isn't me rambling, this is just me speaking from a piece of passion, is that if we can build young people that become those beacons within their community, it snowballs, right? I think of someone like Patoa in Rotorua, um, what he does there and how that can benefit and help more people going into the future. And I, you know, I get scared for more Patoa's been around in 20 years in Rotorua because it freaks me out, but it's amazing at the same token. Um, same with Nikora, same with Naomi and all that stuff. To see these young people becoming our leaders in the future, it's freaky because it's a, it's a pretty out there people, but it's an exciting opportunity that I think is ahead of us. Um, to kind of summarize and wrap things up, how we measure success within young enterprise, it's by talking with people. Um, like I mentioned before, numbers are one thing, but they miss the narrative and they miss the actual impact that can be made. Um, I know sometimes, and I think Naomi mentioned this, um, she was very articulate in how she mentioned it in terms of some audiences that we're trying to serve who may fund us are looking for numbers, um, but we know that the biggest impact is through those conversations. So we're fortunate that with Young Enterprise, we operate in 21 regions across Aotearoa, and we have people that are local in those regions that work with the students. So whilst I don't clearly don't get to know all 4,701 of our students, our people in the regions do get to know them, and they get to talk with them. And it's that connection that allows them to feedback and allows us to learn and to grow our offering going into the future. And then we're in a position of change moving forward because we recognise um, the grow need to support more and more Māori and Pacifica whānau, um, they're going to occupy the majority of our workforce in the future. And what we have now as a program is great, and I champion it. We know that it needs to change in order to be sustainable and have the best impact for, um, to use Shay's words, as words I'd use anyway, the brown faces of the future um, to ensure that we can actually be sustainable to support them and do some incredible things um, in the years to come. So, yeah, that's me, Fano. Pop into our chat after. Love to chat with you all. Chair uh, Kyori. So we'll, um, yeah, just, and just to your point there, we'll, um, you know, we'll take now uh, our energy into breakout groups where we can find the initiative, we'll pick one initiative that we think um, we could add particular value to or we wanted to learn more about or add some thinking to. Um, and um, so I've just put up on screen here the different breakout sessions. We'll have five. Um, Paula, if you can please launch the breakouts and um, then we can self-select which of those two, uh, which of those five we want to go into, please. And we'll, what we'll do, fun, is we're sitting at a two o'clock on the dot. Um, and so we will go for um, 15 minutes in our breakout groups, Kapoi. And so we'll rejoin the space here at 2.15, 15 minutes time. And then we will uh, be moving into a second breakout group that has a slightly different focus. Kia ora. You can please launch those now, Paula. Yes, so for 15 minutes, correct? Correct. And then people can just, so breakouts are open and then people should be able to see them at the bottom of the Zoom. And then if you pop over the one that you wanna go and hop over the number, the blue number, then it will change to join. If you need help, let me know and I can assign you to the room that you want to go. Paul. Always too short, eh? Always too short. Awesome. Well, there's, uh, that, so that was our first breakout group, Fano, an opportunity for us to um, have a chat about looking at particular initiatives that we, you know, think we could um, help out on or ways we could stay in touch with them. Um, what I'm keen to do is to just get a sense of one or two things that were top of mind that we took from the session. If there's anyone from each of them that would like to offer a few thoughts, and I might actually hand it to our, um, our hosts 
um, of, from the various initiatives to do that summary of like a kind of a key co a conversation that was had or a thing that was talked about in the session. So can we start with you, please, Naomi? Thank you. Um, uh, one of the key things is uh, for for um, us is uh, just stuff around um, how do we maintain quality of provision as we say scaling up, and um, uh, some feedback is you know just making sure that we're valuing our people, our staff like they we we in valuing our staff, um, uh, remunerating them. Uh, appropriately um, engaging them and helping all of our staff understand that, um, you know, building up that passion, but also feel a sense of ownership over the over the initiative too, that they're part of growing a movement uh, as well, um, aids with that passion. Mm, which can be quite challenging to honour um, uh, valuing staff at the level we would like to when we are uh, grassroots organisations that run on the smell of oily rags. So that can be part of the challenge. And from the work I've done with various Māori organisations, often that manifests because we Māori organisations tend to be funded by few uh, government contracts um, and don't necessarily have earned income uh, streams, business models beyond um, few limited amounts of funding. So how we could look at through the EHF network, diversifying the range of funding avenues or even better building uh, self-sustaining business models that can always be helpful, hopefully with addressing part of that challenge. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Bye. Um, so uh, Nikura has had to go because it's very early in Dubai. He has to have a quick sleep before this next day of uh, the trade. Great expo. Michelle, could you just um, give us a quick sense of what mm -hmm. Nick, what the conversation was with Nikola and also what his ask might be? Yeah, so because uh, I had seen already that he was after philanthropy, it was how do we help more of the uh, impact and the iwi companies get more philanthropy? And I know this is big to look for Lily as well. Lily said that she left us from Tolaga Bay. Um, so he's going to be in MIQ next week from Sunday onwards for a week. So if anyone's got any ideas and can help him out, he would love to be able to broaden out and get more philanthropy in for his business. And one thing that came quite clearly in it was that the ask, what actually was the ask? So um, it, it took a bit of sort of uh, me prompting him that I knew that he was after philanthropy as opposed to him asking for it. So I think we have to uh, think, how do we get that trust built up there then so that we can actually, uh, people can feel comfortable to ask for what it is that they really want and be quite clear on what that ask is. And to let you know that um, our channels at EHF are open for even non-fellow companies, for people to bring their asks to us. And we've got a whole lot of raft of avenues that we can put them in whether it's your dev you're looking for, whether it's jobs you're wanting to replace, if it's, if it's cash, equity, um, and we can put it out to the fellowship. Thank Michelle, you. thanks for that. I'll, I'll ask the same question of you too, Potawa. Um, uh, any kind of key things that were brought up on, on that session? And then the other question is, what would you see as the big ask that you would have for fellows as well, uh, given the nature of the mahi that you're doing with Rangatahi? Yeah, so then, Alvin, we talked uh, about apprenticeships and about linking up nationally. There's so many opportunities that are happening throughout the country, throughout the world. How can we link all of those up together? Uh, the pathways in teaching, and how do we train? What, what are we training? Are we training for industries of the future, opportunities of now? But then industry, could we get some, um, some really solid help to link up that training to industry direct? And when we were talking about industry, it was consider not just tech, not just marketing, but senior management roles and governance. Even if they're young, they could, they could be a shadow governor. Even if they're young, uh, they could spend a few months in a boot camp to get them really up into senior management. But the younger they learn and gain these experiences inside of an organization and paid, then, and those agreements helped with, with all of the programs together, I think that would really help with, with us as, as trainer providers, and finally with their pathway, plus the runtime, who was really central to all of this. So, Kia ora, kia ora Potawa. And uh, finally to you at Young Enterprise, Ian. 
Um, what were some of the key reflections you had from that quarter? Yeah, so our, I guess, it's kind of some reinforcing on the role we can play across our turtle. Um, and I guess reiterating that, you know, that we're not a Māori organisation, but the reach we have is gives us a responsibility to do more for our rangatahi and to do it in a meaningful and impactful way. And kind of part of the conversation led on from there was what does our regional involvement look like? And so I guess, you know, that's something that probably sits in my head that's something, but I possibly didn't explain it correctly, is that so how Young Enterprise operates across the country is that we have a regional partner in each rohe. And the idea is that it's someone local or a local organization that supports the young people from that space. Um, the, the reasoning behind that is it gives some continuity and some consistency to the people that our young people are exposed to, gives them a place to. And I guess the methods that we, to be able to support young people is we have a person in each region to support the students. We also have a person in each region that supports the teachers. Um, and the goal with that is oftentimes in education and environments like this, we throw all our energy at supporting the young person, but neglect to also support the people, the educators who are with them every day and who are that incredible, um, I guess, support network for them. And so how we have a focus there, where we think it can go beyond is how do we extend that to ensure that we can support whānau in that space. And that's a massive ask and it's a massive, you know, that's, but for us, we see it's where incredible step change can happen. And the reason it's important is because Oftentimes, our young people have, they might have great ambitions, but whether it's mum, dad, nanny, papa, or someone within their final circle may not know too much about those areas or may not know how to direct people. And so, you know, for us, we know that now. And again, like I said before, by knowing that we have an accountability and a responsibility to be able to support that. And I guess so, the ask, um, like anything, always ask for people, would love to always ask for money. And we'll ask for those things, but also being mindful is, I guess, probably what's more particular at this time is asking how we build or how do we get the EHFANO to help us build our young people to recognize the abilities that are within themselves. Um, what more initiatives can we put out there? So young Māori, young Pacifica and young people from marginalized communities recognize their innate abilities, their, the whakapapa that flows through them, um, to help them kind of lead the change for tomorrow. Kāpāi, kia ora, Ian. It's interesting that you and Putai have both talked about this idea of ste stepping up into leadership, which really is that transition from being, uh, as Eru was talking about, people who mahi with the hands to actually being able to use the strategic insights and um, into that kind of level of using, you know, using the brain as the key organ of, um, of value. Hey, so um, I was interested to see that many fellows joined the session or joined the particular breakout around EHF's role in supporting these initiatives, which starts to lift us up beyond any one initiative to look at more the systemic space, the collective impact space. So Rosalie, if you could please share just a few of the reflections from your breakout group. Thank you, and I'd be very happy for anyone else in the group to, to talk because we had quite a wide ranging conversation. Um, really what a lot of it came down to was thinking about what is it that we bring uniquely in our global and our local um, fellowship. And one of the parts of that, which was a, a sort of a starting point was that because our fellows often have a unique global perspective of what is happening in the world, they don't come often through traditional channels of qualification. They come from portfolio careers. And so that ability to be able to inspire with ambition, to tell the stories and bring the visibility of what is possible, we felt was um, one of the areas. Then also, of course, we've got the building of the 21st century skills and the potentials around internships. Um, and uh, really sort of underlying this point, and we had quite a big discussion, which was really sort of related, I guess, to, to business model and one of the tools in which we might do that, which is, you know, what might be the resourcing and how would we do that and how do we ensure that this is part of it? We were just getting into the interesting stuff of where we might be able to take this when, it, when we sort of drew to, uh, drew to an end. But there was one other piece, I think, as well, that was really important. I just wanted to thank, give a huge thank you to you personally, Shay, for both the session and the power of the session, but also talking about collective impact. Because as, a, as, a, as an organization, 
that is built of leaders, global leaders who really seek to have collective impact, this idea of how do we take that collective impact methodology and what would that therefore mean for us? And therefore, how do we take that conversation forward for the Edmund Tillery Fellowship as an organization that is supporting both Aotearoa, but also enabling fellows to be able to be really powerful in the impact that they want to achieve. Hapai, well, you mentioned there, Rosalie, that uh, you kind of ran out of time to really have the substantive corridor around that, but not to worry because we now, for, for those of you who are able to um, stay on the call, um, we, I'd love us to have another 15 minute breakout where we can kind of dive in a little bit more around that collective impact model and to answer those questions around from what we've heard and seen, what do we see as the common agenda? What are we seeing as some of the key problems to solve? What do we see as missing? Where, where are the gaps here? For example, I, I, from what I'm aware of, there's not too much in the Web3 or crypto space in terms of initiatives for young Māori. So are there gaps here that we're seeing around where, how the future is going to show up and what we need to be front-loading? How might EHF leverage our collective potential to be um, an active part of the solution building? What might collective impact model, what might that model look like um, in terms of bringing in um, more funding or creating greater impact for these initiatives? So I'd love us to be able to break out into our next breakout group for 15 minutes. And after that, we will be doing a um, final um, you know, conclusion and we'll be able to go in the rest towards the rest of our days. But um, for those of us who can stay, um, we can... Uh, join a breakout and these ones are not going to be hosted by anyone in particular they're just going to be randomly selected and we do have the uh, document which um, I'm just going to share the link to and that is a place where we can actually start to harvest our notes so if someone at least in each group can please um, contribute some of the thinking and focado that we're hearing uh, I'm going to put that in now some of our speakers have to leave as well and so just before we do break out into our breakouts, a huge me to those who have contributed their whakaaro in this session today, who have given their time to speak to us um, about this particular take that they feel every day in the work that they do. Um, uh, and so for, for your, the words and, and um, ideas that you've shared with us, um, thank you. And for the work that you're doing in your community as a um, right. Um, sweet, so I'm going to call Paula to launch the breakout groups again, if we can get into small groups. Amorehu, the survivors, the ones beyond 2.30pm who didn't have a back-to-back. -back. <laughs> um, so just to do a quick re reminder, uh, reflection, I should say, of our, um, of our session and then just a reminder of some uh, things about what we're to from here. Um, I think that this session, starting off with the, um, the summary that was provided by Eru and Hine Ponamu around this, this challenge really reflects to us that we have quite a significant challenge in front of us. Um, it's a, we're talking about something that's going to affect um, the whole of New Zealand, the economic and the social aspects of our communities. We're talking about a problem that is at scale. We're talking about tens and tens of thousands, potentially hundreds of thousands of people that need to be engaged uh, in pathways and initiatives. Uh, Maori, Pacific and other ethnic minorities so it needs to be culturally imbued so that they have the opportunity to be skilled, educated and transition into high value work or as our Matua uh, Ta Mason jury would say, uh, that we focus on ensuring that they can live as Māori, uh, comfortable in their culture and worldview, that they can be active participants and citizens of the world, and that they can enjoy a high, a good standard of um, health and a high standard of living. So. That's kind of the goal that we're aiming towards. We've heard some of the challenges. We've seen some of the initiatives that are in place to help further that aspiration. Um, we can see that beyond the specific initiatives, we need to take a bit more of a systems approach to addressing this. And so the conversation that we've had around things like collective impact 
and the way in which even EHF can play a role in coordinating, uh, connecting and supporting these kinds of initiatives. Um, this, is the, this is really where the rubber hits the road and this is the enduring conversation that we welcome you to join us in. <clears throat> Just a reminder that we have some further sessions coming up. Uh, on slightly different topics, but interestingly enough, there seems to be this common theme of ecosystems and collective impact about them. Tomorrow at 9 a.m. New Zealand time, we have a session around measuring what matters, the global best practices and the impact measurement space to create a framework and tools for holistic impact measurement. Um, <clears throat> tomorrow, 3 p.m. New Zealand time, a session around taking a systems view of our New Zealand startup uh, and innovation ecosystem and how we can grow that, not disconnected from the conversation we had today. And then uh, on Friday or November the 19th at 8 a.m. New Zealand time, a conversation around New Zealand's priorities and opportunities in the emerging decade of action on climate. So uh, in terms of moving forward from here, uh, we have a form, like a little Google form that we'll put out, which is really just uh, seeking your views of um, which initiatives, if any, you'd like to stay in touch with or contribute to moving forward. We'll make sure we send out um, details of, of the key leaders of those initiatives and just to get your sense of the highlights and any suggestions you have from the session. Um, so we'll make sure that form comes out. We'll be sending out a copy of the recording. Uh, we still have that harvesting doc if you would like to Put any further commentary in there as you as your ideas percolate, and that's going to be useful uh, for the team that are behind the scenes pulling together um, the summary document led by Bex, one of our fellows. Um, and we'll also be looking then at the role that EHF can play in an enduring sense in. Uh, enabling some of these initiatives and core, you know, what role it can play in the coordination piece moving forward. So thank you all for joining us for this quarter all today. Um, I'm just going to check if Rosalie had any further last things to add. No, no, it's no. A huge and heartfelt thank you for the effort, for all the effort that you've put in Shay, for every one of the speakers and for those that have attended um, through the session. This for us does feel really important. We think it's the beginning of a conversation. So I know that it's been, you know, something of a, of a marathon and there's a huge amount that we have to think about and absorb, but frankly, I've never had the opportunity to have this conversation like this before. So, you know, the mahi and the work is incredible and we're excited about where we can take it from here. So thank you. Rosalie. And just to talk all that, I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate enough, I do get to have the conversations about this all the time, even at a government level. And this particular thing I'm fortunate about for today is that we were all able to participate in it with those community Māori leaders who are literally like at the forefront of creating that change and helping us drive some of this these initiatives um, forward. So um, we've been blessed and, and, and you know, the Māori leaders that are involved in those initiatives are blessed to have had your um, willingness to participate in the conversation. Oh boy, well, I'll just close our um, hui with a karakia. This karakia is not, oh, this karakia is about closing down this as a learning space to enable us to transition back into uh, whatever is next for us on our day. Um, and to uh, let any of the barriers and any of the heaviness from this conversation as well lift a little from our shoulders so that we can get on with the, the next thing that requires our energy. No reira, a me kara kia tātou. Waka iria hia te tapu, kia wā te ai te ara, kia tūru ki whakataha ai, kia tūru ki whakataha ai, haumie hui e, tāraki e. Ka ki te koutou.